I think I'm going to call on Senator Kennedy instead. Senator Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Booker. You're a fine American, sir. Um, Ms. Abrams, can, can you hear me? I don't know where to look. I hate these Zoom hearings. Yes, sir. Um, in terms of, of voter confidence in, in our, our uh, electoral system and perception of voter integrity and voter in, or, and election, let me start over. I'm sorry. In terms of uh, the confidence that Americans have in their electoral system, do you think we're better off having an election day or an election month? I think we are better off having a process that allows every single American the opportunity to participate in elections. And given that the initial notion of an election day was based on an agrarian economy that no longer exists for millions of Americans, and given the fact that we have a number of Americans who are limited in their access because in states like Georgia, there is no paid time off for voting, I think we have to make every opportunity to make voting accessible to every American. There is no other entity I'm, I'm, that would be stop denied. You, I've, got a, so, I, I've, I've got a bunch of questions for you sure. before you get off the subject and get me off. So you're okay with us not knowing, say, weeks or months after an election who the winner is? Yes. Okay. We have had times in this Can country where we me, have not known. Talking about the Georgia bill, help me understand. And I'm not interested in, in a, a 30,000 foot view. That's not meant to be a criticism. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to myself, I guess. I'm not interested in platitudes. Tell me, you, you, you're against the Georgia bill, I gather. Is that right? I'm against certain provisions of it, yes. Okay, and I think you've called it a racist bill. Am I right? I think there are provisions of it that are racist, yes. Okay. Tell me specifically, just give me a list of the provisions that you object to. I object to the provisions that remove access to the right to vote, that shorten the federal runoff period from nine weeks to four weeks, okay. restrict the time that a voter can request and return an absentee ballot application, that eliminate- one, slow, slow down for ballot. me, because our, our audio is not real good here. Certainly. Could you start uh, over so, for me? Certainly. Thank it, you, ma'am. It shortens the federal runoff period from nine weeks to four weeks. Okay. It restricts the time a voter can request and return an absentee ballot application. Right. It requires that a voter have a photo identification or some other form of identification that they're willing to surrender in order to participate in the absentee ballot um, process. That, that, if I can stop you, that's that's where they're going uh, to, to uh, not comparing signatures, but to voter ID. Yes, yep. sir. And as Ms. Eiffel has pointed out, we would become only the fourth state in the nation to require voters to put at yes, risk what, their what, identity. What, what else? What else? It eliminates over 300 hours of Dropbox availability. Okay, it what else? Nearly, it bans nearly all out of precinct votes. Bans it what? I'm sorry. Out of, it bans nearly all out of precinct votes. Okay. Meaning that if you get to a precinct, and you are in line for four hours and you get to the end of the line and you are not there between 5 and 7 p.m. Okay, you what have else? To start all over again. Is that everything? And, no, it is not. <laughs> no, sir. It restricts the hours of operation because it now, under the guise of setting a standardized timeline, it makes it optional for counties that may be... Mm -hmm. Um, may not want to see expanded access to the right to vote. They can now limit their hours instead of those hours being from seven to seven. They're now from nine to five, which may have an effect on voters who cannot vote during business hours on, during early voting. It limits the voting Okay, I hours. get the idea. I get the idea. Yes. Let me ask you this. Let me approach this another way. If a state decides to require a voter to prove who the voter says he is or she is. Do you consider that racist? Not at all, sir. Voter identification has been a part of the American theory of democracy almost from the beginning. You're okay I with support, it? I'm, I support voter identification, yes. Okay. How about ballot harvesting? 
where, and I heard earlier you were talking about letting the tribal elders uh, collect back. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about where the, the parties, and believe me, both parties will do it and probably are doing it, pay operatives to go out and help people with their ballots and collect their ballots. Are you okay with that or are you against that? I don't think it's an either or situation. I think it depends on what the conditions are, what the rules are, but making it easier for those who want to participate in elections to do so with safely and securely, I think it's- So you're okay concerned. with ballot harvesting? No, sir, I did not say that. I said, because that is a term of art that encompasses a wide range of behaviors. And even well, I'm, your example- I'm sorry, not, but I'm trying to get down from the platitudes and understand what you're for and against. But um, sir, what I'm, what I'm help, for help, is, me, help me with this. Let's suppose that, that the Republican Party wanted to hire people to go out and knock on doors of voters and say, have you, have you voted yet with your mail ballot? And they say no. And then the, the, the operatives are sent, told to, to contact the voter and say, let me help you with your ballot. If you have any questions, I can even suggest to you, you might want to vote for. And after you vote it, vote, I'll collect the ballot for you, make it easy. Is that okay? Sir, I, I'm both an attorney and a former legislator, and it is not simply the words that you're I, saying. I'm an attorney much. and a current legislator, and I might yes, trade places with you, but keep going. And so my, my point is, as you and I both know, that the context, the rules, and the structure matters. Now, in the very narrow circumstance that you just described, if there are no controls and if it, it, it turns into buying votes, of course I object to that. Okay. But if, if you look at this, the piecemeal components that you're describing, and if we are talking about how do we make it easier for voters to participate in elections, I'm not certain what that looks like, but what you described in this very specific and narrow construct it sounds like you're in violation of a number of different rules, not the least of which is buying a vote. All right, let me ask you one last question. Our, our chairman's really indulged me here. Do you think it was a smart thing for President Biden to do when he called everybody who supported the Georgia bill a racist? I think that this bill is grounded in racial animus. I think that the language that we are using to describe Can I ask you how you know that, madam? I mean, because, that's an honest question. How do you know that? Because for 15 years, the Republican Party of Georgia not only sanctioned, but celebrated its vote by mail provisions. It was only after voters of color for the first time in 15 years successfully used those provisions in favor of the party that they disproportionately support that those rules changed. It is that for years, for more than nearly two decades, we had early voting hours that supported voters that were perfectly fine. It was only after communities of color used those, those provisions but, in but excess But why doesn't that hurt black people and white people and brown people? This is what I'm- I think it hurts everyone. I, I, if you watched me, I have fought for the right to vote for every person. I, I no agree. one is entitled to But that's to a long way from the president calling people a racist because they support a state. Sir, Sir yeah. I'm, ex I'm responding to the question that you asked me. My point is that when your motivation is grounded in the race of those who are engaging in behaviors that you disagree with, that is racist, particularly when it is targeted at communities of color by people in power. I, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. The, the chairman's have gaveled me. I just need to ask, how do you know that's what they meant? Because we asked them not to do it because we showed them what the effect was and they refused to answer and they refuse to abide. I, I worked with these people for 11 years. I don't believe that every single person who supported this bill has deep racial animus in their hearts for all purposes, but for the purposes of voting rights, when racial animus is your predicate, then yes, you should be held accountable and those bills should be stopped. Thank you. I'm sorry. I went over, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Padilla. I'm sorry, Senator. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I invite Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Abrams, it's been over two years and you still refuse to concede that you lost the race for governor in Georgia in 2018. You have said that, quote, you do not concede that the process was proper and that, quote, they stole it from the voters of Georgia. Yes or no, today, 
do you still maintain that the 2018 Georgia election was stolen? As I've always said, I acknowledged at the very beginning that I that Brian Kemp won under the rules that were in place. What I object to are rules that permitted thousands of Georgia voters to be denied their participation in this election or to have their votes cast out. And so I will continue to disagree with the system until it is fixed. We have seen market progress made, and unfortunately, it was undone in SB202. But I will continue to advocate for a system that permits every eligible Georgian to cast their ballots. Ms. Ms. Abrams, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you to, to please a answer the question I asked, which is, do you, yes or no, do you still maintain the 2018 election was stolen? That's your language. My full language was that it was stolen from the voters of Georgia. We do not know what they would have done because not every eligible Georgian was permitted to participate fully in the election. So you also told the New York Times that your loss, quote, was fully attributable to voter suppression. Uh, Ms. Abrams, do you know in Georgia whether the percentage of, of African-American Georgians who are registered to vote and who turned out to vote, is it higher or lower than the national average? It is higher than the national average because Georgia is one of the largest states with an African-American population. But it, it, that's not tied to the size of the population. The percentage of black Georgians who are registered to vote in 2018 is 64.7%. That compares to 60.2% as the national average. The percentage of Georgians who voted in 2018, the election you claim was stolen from you, was 56.3%. That's higher than the national average of 48%. Let me ask you this, Ms. Abrams. In 2018, do you know which demographic group in Georgia had the highest registration percentage and the highest turnout percentage? I have a guess, but I will defer to you for the answer. The answer is African Americans had the highest registration and the highest turnout, despite your claiming that the election was stolen and there was somehow voter suppression. Uh, let's shift to, a, to the Georgia law in particular, which there have been mountains of lies spread by, by both Democratic politicians and by the press. Does the Georgia law reduce the number of early voting days? Yes or no? Yes. It does so because you have to look at it in total. It is not simply looking at the number of days that were expanded for 40% of the population, which for 60% of the population had been the norm. It also has to look at the early voting runoff days that were indeed shortened. It, if you add it, is it the correct total that the days, law increases it, the number of mandatory days of early weekend voting? It is a partial answer to say that certain days were increased in certain counties that had not participated in the use of all of those days of elections. They had been optional, and most 60% of Georgians had been able to vote for those full number of days. 40% will now join, and that is a good thing. But at the exact same time, this same bill eliminates weeks of early voting during runoff elections and limits and allows the elimination of weekend voting. Do you believe that requiring an ID to vote suppresses votes? As I have said, written, testified, and have repeated today, I believe that voter identification is always appropriate. You should know who is voting. What I object to are the ways that we are narrowing and restricting who has access to the right to vote. And that has been a common and necessary complaint. As we noted in 2018, what happened to Native Americans in North Dakota who were denied the right to vote because they were required to have, they were required to have photo identification that included language and included perquisites that they were not entitled to demand. When we have narrowing of opportunities without expansion of access, that is absolutely wrong and I will stand against it in Georgia and everywhere. During the 2020 election, did your organization, Fair Fight, collect ballots for voters? And if so, were not. the people collecting ballots for your organization paid? We did not collect ballots. We did not pay people to collect ballots. We sent to voters absentee ballot applications, as did the Secretary of State, as did a number of other organizations, because in the midst of a pandemic, we thought it was important for voters who may or may not have had information about what their rights were to ensure that they had the education and opportunity for engagement in our elections.
So I want to be clear about your testimony to this committee. Your testimony is that your organization did not pay any person in the state of Georgia in 2020 uh, to collect ballots for anybody else. No, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Governor Murphy. Thank you not only for this invitation, but thank you for your leadership on voting rights. As you mentioned, New Jersey has been leading the way with automatic voter registration, with having the foresight and the humility to understand that redemption for those who come out of our prisons and jails must include a reintroduction into the full measure of citizenship. As someone who's not only fought for voting rights, but has been working hard on the census, your actions taken to address prison gerrymandering are crucial because we cannot build a stronger society if we do not include the needs of every person. And that's the fundamental premise of democracy. Not that we get everything we want, but that we deserve to have a say in the direction of our nation, in the direction of our states, and in the direction of our communities. And when democracy is undermined by laws that we have seen passed, not only in Georgia, but in Iowa, and laws that are under consideration in Arizona, in Texas, in New Hampshire, in Florida, in 43 states across this country, we are seeing an onslaught, an attack on democracy. And there is one Arizona representative who actually explained it. Essentially, he said that they don't want every vote to count. They don't believe that quantity matters, that it's about the quality of the vote. Well, my question is, how do you qualify the utility of a vote? I believe that citizenship in the United States of America is a premise that we must stand on, and it says that we have the right to be heard. We are going to lose some of the elections we want to win, and we're going to win some of the elections we never thought could be true. But we are always, always as a nation stronger when every voice is included. And that is why this work is so critical. In-person early voting says to Americans who have to work on a schedule that isn't based on an agrarian economy from the 18th century that their voices matter. It says to that mom working that third shift that if she can get some time off to go and cast her ballot, she might be able to move herself out of minimum wage into a full-time job that pays her enough to live a good life for her and her family. It says to that person who is a frontline worker who doesn't know when they're going to be on call, that if they can cast their ballot, there may be relief on the other side. In-person early voting is one more vestige of a country that believes in the democracy it espouses, but more importantly, that believes in the people that it shelters. You see, what we saw on January 5th in Georgia was the election of the first African-American and the first Jewish senator from the state of Georgia. And yet what we saw on January 6th was intended to be a repudiation of an election, a repudiation of an entire system. And we did not let that domestic terrorism work then, and we should not let it work now. And I am so excited to be looking up, looking at New Jersey, knowing that New Jersey is taking us in the right direction. But my eyes will never leave Georgia, will never leave the states that still need this type of leadership and this type of support. Because anytime you have a governor willing to win elections by stealing the voices of their people, they do not deserve to hold those jobs. But it's, it's up to us, the voters of America, to stand together, whether we're in Georgia, in Texas, or in New Jersey, to say that we are one nation under God, and that we are one nation whose democracy should not depend on our geography. And so to Governor Murphy, to the state legislature, to the Secretary of State, and to all the allies who made this possible, you have my heartiest not only congratulations, but you have my gratitude because you are showing the way to a better democracy and a better future for us all. Thank you so much. Stacy, bless you. Before you go, I repeat what I said to you privately. When I sign the bill, you're gonna get an official Phil Murphy, uh, New Jersey pen. We will sanitize it and send it down to you. Uh, thank you for everything. You know what's a shocking reminder? You and I, when I, I referenced that phone call, uh, after we won the two seats in Georgia, you and I spoke the morning of January 6th Good. before all hell broke loose a few hours later. Just extraordinary, the juxtaposition of that call between those two extraordinary victories and the hell that rained down in the Capitol only a few hours later. I know you got to go. Thank you so much. We look forward once we start doing things in person. We have the red carpet out for you. We'd love to have you back up in Jersey. And in the meantime, stay safe, stay strong, and thank you for all you do. Thank you. Wow, that was a treat. And another treat. Uh, the Carter Baker uh, Commission looked at 
uh, voter fraud in voting in 2008, they found that uh, there's no evidence of extensive fraud in U.S. elections or multiple voting, but both occur and it could affect the outcome of close elections and many other findings. Uh, the absentee ballots remain the largest source of potential voter fraud. That's what the Carter-Baker Commission said, not me. Uh, the Carter-Baker report said, uh, recommend to reduce fraud, recommend prohibiting third-party organization candidates and political party activists from handling absentee ballots. I think that's related to ballot harvesting. So my question for Ms. Ms. Abrams, do you support voter identification laws? Yes. Okay. Do you there support- There are 35 states in the United States that have had voter identification laws. Okay. In fact, every state requires some form of identification. Okay. What I have objected to is restrictive voter identification laws so, that narrow the set of permissible materials right. that allow the, you to the answer is The answer is yes is a concept. Do you support the idea that voting should be limited to American citizens? Yes. Do you support that we should have, uh, do you support ballot harvesting? Are you familiar with that term? I'm familiar with the term of art that's been propagated to describe a variety of efforts. But for example, in Native American reservations where they are precluded from access due to underfunding to reach uh, in a timely fashion locations for voting, I do believe that it's appropriate for tribal elders to collect the ballots and retrieve them and use a single source of delivery to provide those ballots and thus provide Native Americans with the opportunity to participate in elections. Do you, I think do you support it beyond Native American voting? I, as I've said, I believe that it depends on the situation and that the term of art that is being used describes a variety of behaviors and each of those behaviors should be examined for utility and for veracity, and to the extent that they help voters participate in elections in a lawful manner, they should be permitted. Okay. Do you believe the Republican majority in Georgia, House, Senate, when they are making the changes to your state voting laws, do you think they're motivated by trying to suppress African American vote? I have seen it happen sometimes that they are. I've seen other bills that have been truly bipartisan in nature that have looked at and fully so, examined. But you believe that's the motivation behind, do you believe that's I'm the sorry, motivation sir. behind these laws? I believe the motivation behind certain provisions in SB 202 are a direct result to the increased participation of communities of color in the 2020 and 2021 elections. I have participated for 11 years. As Speaker Pro Tem Jones pointed out, we served together and almost every year there was a voting law. And when those voting laws were neutral, not only on their face, well, I, I'm their out of time. Do you I think? Do you it. think the speaker of the the House, Speaker Pro Tem, the lady, um, Jan Jones, is motivated by trying to limit the African American voters in Georgia? Do you think? I that's believe there is racial animus that generated those bills. I would not assume that that racial animus is shared by every person. But Thank if you. the result Thank is that racial animus exists and it, it eliminates access to the right to vote, then regardless of a certain person's heart, if the effect is deleterious to the ability of people of color to participate in elections, then that is problematic and that is wrong and it should be rejected by all. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses. Um, I'm just looking at the facts and I think that we need to get these facts straight. Uh, in the 2020 election, more than 160 million Americans. I think this is a celebration, so let's hear it. 100 days. 100 days. 100 days after we got Georgia in line and in the blue. 100 days after we sent Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff to the U.S. Senate. 100 days after Georgia came through for America again. That is worthy of celebration. But we're also here to talk about what we are recovering from. Why we have to get back on track because this nation has suffered for four years of hypocrisy and amnesia. 
four years of lying about who we are and forgetting what we're about. Four years of misinformation, misdirection, and miscommunication. But America is back on track because of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. 100 days of greatness. You see, my, my, friends in the, my friends in Congress have talked about what's been accomplished. They spoke about the importance of getting shots in the arms of millions, hundreds of millions of Americans. They've talked about the fact that we have delivered economic recovery, so long promised but finally delivered. We've lifted children out of poverty, we've lifted people out of sickness, and we've lifted depression into hope. That is what we've done in 100 days led by Joe Biden. We remember, you see, we, we didn't have the hypocrisy of saying that we wanted to believe in family values but not care about families. That's why Joe Biden did the American Rescue Plan and that's why he's fighting for the American Families Plan. Because you see, he understands that you can't say you love families if you don't care about their children. You can't say you stand for families if they can't go home and take care of one another when they're sick. You can't say you believe in families if you don't believe in getting them vaccinated and getting them health care and getting them all the way through education. But he didn't stop with the American Rescue Plan or the American Families Plan because he understands that our economy is back. And that's why he has the American Jobs Plan. You see, we have a country where some hypocrisy has been running rampant, where we said we want to create jobs, we just don't want to help anyone create those jobs. We want to create jobs, but we want to pay anybody for doing that work. We want to create jobs, but we don't want it to cost anything, do anything, or be anybody's responsibility. Well, Joe Biden said no to that. He said that he's going to put his presidency where his promises were. And that is that he's going to stand up for infrastructure, for rebuilding this nation. But we're going to go further. We're going to build for the future. That is why we're celebrating the first 100 days. Because we've got a president who doesn't suffer from hypocrisy, but he also doesn't suffer from amnesia. You see, when he said that he was going to stand with our families, he did it. When he said he was going to fight for voting rights, he's doing it. He didn't stand silently by. When people were harmed, he put a justice department together that is taking people to court and taking justice back into our hands. We've got a president who understands that talking about being green isn't just a, a it's not just words that we use, it's a belief that we have to hold. Because you see, climate action is happening whether we want it to or not. I mean, look, guys, it's, it's not even May in Georgia and it's already hot. But the heat that's here in Georgia, the heat that's rising across this country is a heat that's on fire for change and for real action, for rejoining the Paris Accords, for putting money into clean energy, but for investing in those communities that have been left out for so long. That's what Joe Biden is all about. We've got 100 days behind us, but we've got a long way to go. And you see, the way we get there is the work that we've been doing, the work we've been anchoring here in Georgia in the fight for voting rights. You see, last night, Joe Biden called out for action, for bipartisan action, because in the amnesia category is the fact that for so many years, voting rights was a bipartisan endeavor. Through 2006, it was Democrats and Republicans who fought to renew the Voting Rights Act. It suddenly, though, after 2013, Republicans have forgotten that they were part of the architecture of getting good done. Well, we're inviting them back to the table. But we know that voting rights has to be done because that's where all of our other rights are grounded. And we need the For the People Act because the people need relief. Bills like SB 202 here in Georgia and the terrible versions of it around the country are looking to steal our voices and take our choices. And we will not stand for that in this democracy. And Joe Biden and Kamala Harris understand that voting rights is not about partisanship, despite what some people would have you believe with their clever slogans and their fun taglines. 
when you tell somebody that too many people showed up so you're going to shut down the opportunities, that too many people mailed in their voices and so you're going to slow down their opportunities. You see, voting rights is not about partisanship, it's about citizenship. And we are Americans standing together. Because when you hear Joe Biden speak, when you've heard him talk about voting rights, you've never heard him say he wants voting rights for Democrats or voting rights for Republicans. When he talks about the American Rescue Plan, he didn't say he was going to rescue blue states, not red states. He said he was going to rescue the United States of America. When he said he wanted an American Families Plan, these weren't Democratic families or Republican families. These were American families. And when he said he's building American jobs in the American Jobs Plan, these aren't Democratic jobs or Republican jobs. These are American jobs. And these are anchored by American voting rights. And that's why we need the For the People Act to pass. That's why we need the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to pass. Because in a democracy, in our democracy, in our nation, our pledge to one another is not that we always agree, but that we always have the right to speak. Our promise is not that we win every election. God knows that's not the promise. But the promise is we get to be heard in that election. That is how we get the rights we need. That's how we get the policies we need. That's how we get the future we deserve. And there is one man fighting every day to make that so. And that is why I am so excited to be right here today as we get back on track and focus on the next 100 days with Joe Biden as our president, with Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff as our senators, with our extraordinary congressional delegation, and with the people of Georgia leading the way because we're back on track and the future belongs to all of us. Thank you all so much. Take care.